good afternoon to everyone who is in the US and good evening to those who are in Europe. We want to welcome you to the last event of this year's German American Conference. Letizia, Valeria and I are part of this year's organizing team and I'm very excited to welcome you all to our panel discussion, Good Patterns, Bad Patterns, as protecting the pharmaceutical industry also benefit the most vulnerable. Today, we will take a deep dive into the world of patents, legal constructs around patent rights and how this impacts access to medicines. We are looking forward to using this current momentum to disentangle the debate around the patent waivers and to shed some light on the implications from, for the pharmaceutical industry, governments and people living in both high, low and middle income countries. We want to welcome our panelists, Lee Haynes and Ira Spector, as well as our moderator, C Stephen Saunders. Thank you everyone for joining us and sticking around for the last event of this year's German American Conference. We warmly encourage you to post your questions in the Q&A on your bottom right. We're very much looking forward to hear your insights as well. Thank you. And now over to you, Stephen. Hi. Thank you very much, Latina. Um, impressive that I'm glad, as I was saying, that we're not competing with a uh, people rushing to the airport since we're the last one at the conference that usually happens. I guess with Zoom, we don't have to worry about that. Um, anyways, thanks for um, having us here and uh, we're looking forward to having this talk with you. Um, first, I'd like to introduce, have the panelists introduce themselves um, and I'll go last. Uh, let's start off with Lee Haynes. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you for the invitation to be a part of this panel. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I'm Lee Haynes. I live in Brussels, Belgium. Um, I'm a lawyer. I'm also a public health professor at Simmons University in Boston. So I, I run the midnight shift um, teaching across the Atlantic on Zoom in the middle of the night. Um, and my work has um, been in the field of health and human rights, um, kind of raising awareness and doing advocacy around the importance of um, achieving all human rights in order for people to achieve the right to health as embodied in um, the International Covenants on Human Rights. Um, I am a part of, and I guess representing to a certain extent here, um, the European Citizens Initiative, um, the No Profit on Pandemic or Right to Cure Citizens Initiative, depending on what platform you're looking at. Um, and we're organizing across the EU in order to um, get signatures, which when we reach a certain threshold, um, will oblige, um, legally oblige the European Commission to consider, put forth um, policy law that will increase access to COVID vaccines, treatments, and therapeutics um, for everyone across the globe and um, work towards closing the vaccine inequity that we see now. And part of that is um, around patents and intellectual property that's um, right now working to prevent access for a lot of um, people who need these life-saving drugs around the world. Thanks. All right, thanks, Lee. And Ira Spector, um, Ira has a uh, background in the pharmaceutical industry also, and uh, Ira, speak Tell a little bit about yourself, Ira. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here with everyone in this uh, Zoom format. Uh, I'm uh, a drug developer, I'm actually trained as a biostatistician and epidemiologist. Uh, I've been involved in the development of 34 approved drugs. Uh, I have conducted drug research in 67 countries around the world, uh, including the development of several vaccines. Um, I've uh, ex Wyeth, Pfizer, Icon, and I'm Allergan, and I'm currently running a small biotech. Um, so I'm uh, here to talk about the practical aspects associated with developing vaccines and uh, making them available uh, uh, in global health and uh, appreciate being here. Thank you. Thanks, Ira. A little bit about me. I'm a, uh, I've am been a patent lawyer for nearly 30 years. I chair the Intellects Property Department at Nutter, McLennan & Fish in Boston, a firm that was established by, interestingly, a uh, social justice, um, real social justice warrior, Louis Brandeis, who um, Brandeis University is named after. Of course, the firm can't be named after him as because he was on the Supreme Court in the 1890s. But um, I, like most patent lawyers, went to school to be something else and then decided, hey, law school is a good idea. Left turned into that and um, been a great, you know, it's a great 
great journey. Uh, been very heavily involved in the startup community and uh, an angel investor in a bunch of startups and consequently really plug, you know, plugged into the, at least in Boston, the local startup community. It's great, great, um, great, great practice to have. Anyway, so let's get on to the discussion today. Um, I'm, as, I mentioned, as I mentioned, I'm the moderator and I'm gonna ask questions of our two fine panelists and they, are, they can feel free to ask each other questions if they want to. And it's all, again, to be, we wanna be collaborative and, and uh, just get some ideas out, get some thoughts out on the, on the table and uh, uh, you know, see what people are thinking. We'd love to get your questions. We're gonna have about a half hour of discussion and then about 10 or 15 minutes of Q&A, open Q&A, but you can still ask questions in real time. And I know I'll, I'll try to answer as many as I can. But before we really jump into this, it might be a good idea to have a little bit of background on um, patents and why we're even, what, what the main issue here is that we're talking about today. So at a very, very high level, this is something I can speak to. I'm not necessarily the pharmaceutical insider, but uh, I'm the patent person, I'm a patent expert. Um, really, first question is, what does a patent do for you? I mean, is it something just to hang on the wall? I mean, what I've got behind me, not behind me, but on my background is a picture of an old patent from, I don't know, 100 years ago, and they look a lot different now. But what is a patent? It's actually a way to protect your intellectual property. The intellectual property is what you thought of already. And so you say, gee, you know, protecting your intellectual property, that's, that's sort of esoteric. What does it really do for you? What legal rights does it give you? And it gives you one right and one right only, the right to stop other people from making, using, or selling the technology. Now, again, it gives you the offensive right to stop other people. That means you have to go to court and stop other people who infringe your patent. And it's a limited monopoly. Monopolies are illegal, by the way. Um, this is a legalized monopoly with the intention of incentivizing innovation in incentivizing us to progress in the technical and scientific uh, world. Like anything else though, it's nothing's perfect. There are positives and negatives and trade-offs that we make. I've dedicated my career to it. So I, I obviously seem to think it's a pretty good, uh, pretty good thing to have in our, in our system. Um, ultimately in this context, it typically people like to think pharmaceutical companies People developing pharma uh, drugs are investing billions of dollars into making, coming up with these new invent innovations, and it would be tough. It'd be terrible if they invested. And a lot of times they're they're spending multiple parallel. Um, this is what people like Ira tell me, or you know, in the in the business tell me. I'm not directly in that business, but I understand they have parallel drug development processes, and they know a bunch of them are going to fail, and they're going to have hundreds of millions into each one. So they want to. They need to uh, get the benefit of their R and D and the, the the capital that they put up, the risk they put up, and get a fair, get a return for it. I, I almost said fair return, but the word fair is something that's been batted around and it's too subjective. I don't know how I can define that. Um, so really, patents are though something that are governed by a country. So if we get a patent in the US, it doesn't mean, it means if you only have a patent in the US, you can do anything you want anywhere else in the country. It, the patent's not effective. And so what happened was a lot of countries got together and they, they created this treaty. There's a lot of treaties, but one of the treaties we're gonna talk about today is the TRIPS treaty, T-R-I-P-S. IP is intellectual property, is in the middle of the, that acronym. And uh, it was developed in the eighties, but it really came into play in the nineties. And it basically set minimum standards for protecting intellectual property in different countries in exchange for open markets. And there are all kinds of various commercial reasons for doing it. And intellectual property, in this case, we'll talk about uh, patents, a way to protect patents and then the pharmaceutical area. And so uh, unfortunately in this current situation, in, you know, we have this COVID crisis and you wonder, gee, you know, uh, let, you know, how do you, we need to make have more people have access to this for the better of the people who need the access and for the people who don't even need it because there are secondary benefits of all this access. And so that's what we're here to discuss today. Um, recently, so like India and I think it was the South Africa had signed on and said, hey, let's waive this right, this obligation and let's let people have um, 
you know, more access to drugs by waiving a lot of the TRIPS requirements of protecting certain things in the, that help people with uh, get past COVID. And uh, that's one of, that's again, one of the reasons we're here. So I guess the first question I really have uh, is more a question for Lee. I mean, why aren't the current flexibilities of like the business world today working for, or why are they not good enough? Why do we have to take this extreme measure of um, saying, forget it, we're not gonna, we don't wanna um, let these companies come, um, make money off of their patents? Um, yeah, that's a great way to start off. Um, <laughs> I think that, or at least part of what we're seeing um, in the EU, um, but also many of the governments who are um, kind of opposed to this waiver proposal that India and South Africa and over 100 other um, countries around the world have supported, um, we're seeing a lot of pushback from governments saying, like you said, that, um, you know, this really infringes on, um, you know, the rights of pharmaceutical companies and it might set a bad precedent um, and things like that. And so, um, and so one of the interesting things and like what the flexibilities are, there was a um, the Doha declaration um, on the TRIPS agreement back in like 2001. Um, and there's a special part of that um, declaration on public health emergency saying that their you know, patents should be waived, there should be compulsory licensing um, whereby companies, other companies who don't own the patents can make um, these medicines. Um, so that this should happen in the case of public health emergencies and um, we are certainly in a public health emergency right now. And so what has begun to come to light um, at least among us in the access to medicines kind of advocacy world is that um, many of the pharmaceutical companies play this really outsized role in determining the lay of the land. Um, and so when it comes to um, pricing, um, for example, and I guess the, often the targets here are, I'm thinking of the mRNA vaccines, um, Pfizer and Moderna or BioNTech, Pfizer and Moderna, um, they're really expensive. And, um, and so countries, developing countries, poor countries can't afford those vaccines. And so when asked to lower prices, um, the prices aren't lowered. There's also um, limited production capacity. So as companies are like, no, this is our IP, these are our, this is our property, we'll do what we want with it. Um, they're not able to produce enough for the world. And so, um, and many countries stand ready to learn how to make these um, medicines, vaccines, but um, the pharma companies or no one really is kind of reaching out to say, hey, let's work together to, um, to make these medicines. Um, and actually this week, the WHO um, pulled together a team from a startup in, um, on the African continent, I think a team in South Africa to try to figure out the technology behind MRI vaccines so they can start teaching other people how to make them. But, um, but you know, if, you know, over a year ago, Pfizer or Moderna would have tried to teach others, then, um, you know, things might be going a little bit more smoothly. Um, uh, right, but right. I'll stop there. I won't keep it. No, no, no. <laughs> no, it made me think like, uh, I mean, a lot of yeah. this problem goes beyond uh, just the drug itself. I mean, there's yeah. the, the supply <laughs> chain, right? I mean, exactly. if so, um, that's a, that's an interesting point, but I mean, uh, Ira though, I mean, polio vaccine was made and Jonas Salk and Albert Sullivan, they, they didn't patent it. That's correct. And, yeah. I mean, what, what, why is it, why, why should all these companies be patenting things today then you know, for this, for this vaccine and what benefit, you know, what's, well, what's different today versus then? Yeah, let's go back to that. And uh, I can remember when I was four years old, waiting online on a hot sunny day for about two blocks to get my polio vaccine. So um, yeah, I, I, I'm old enough to remember that. And um, <laughs> uh, um, Jonas Salk said that patenting the polio vaccine <clears throat> would be like patenting the sun. 
Uh, he did not believe it was patentable, and he made sure that the rights were freely available. But here's what happened. Um, what people don't remember is something that we call the Cutter incident. incidents. There were um, a number of companies who were given the formula, uh, given the art, taught how to make the vaccine. And one of them, Cutter Pharmaceuticals, uh, it accidentally released batches of vaccine where this was a live uh, kill vaccine where a live polio virus unfortunately was given to children and they got polio. Um, I am not at all opposed to vaccine manufacturers donating finished product uh, to other countries. Um, I think that um, that is the right way, approach to use here to create equitable distribution. I am very concerned about uh, either patent waivers uh, or um, you know, giving people the patents to go ahead and make these vaccines because in a natural product derived uh, uh, drug uh, or biological, uh, the saying is that the product is the process, meaning that it's not just the patent for the molecule that counts, it's the manufacturing process that defines whether or not the finished product will work. And the complexity of doing that is extreme. I worked on a drug called Enbrel, and we had to decide whether to spend $3 billion to build a world-scale plant before we sold a single commercial vial. Now imagine you are a big pharma and you have to go to Wall Street and raise money, Moderna being a fairly new company, by the way, this is their only product. And you have to convince investors to give you billions of dollars to enable you to build facilities to make these products before you sell a single dose. That's the situation we're in. I would much rather see pressure placed on companies to donate, to expand capacity and donate, to provide high quality product, then risk giving away some of the know-how because I'm sure the patents don't cover all the manufacturing process know-how. They probably cover formulations mostly um, and risk another cutter incident where we could have a product that could be contaminated or cause other health issues being made by um, a, you know, unauthorized uh, manufacturer. That's my biggest concern about this. I, I would much rather see um, these products be donated. And by the way, since the uh, original statement by, um, by Jonas Salk, uh, we have found ways to patent biologicals. So the analogy that it's like patenting the sun no longer uh, applies. There are many biologicals that have been patented but the key to making them is not just that molecule. It's the process associated with making them that requires significant art. And that's my biggest concern. So, all right. I mean, you raised an interesting thing. First, number one, I, I don't remember Jonas Salk getting his degree, law degree. But um, secondly, uh, the more important thing is um, we're talking about patents. And patents are usually something that you can tell if somebody's infringing, right? I mean... If you take a part, you know, you get a drug and you figure out the formulation behind it, sure, you can tell if that someone's infringed. You can pick your patent next to it, look at the formulation, and figure out if it's infringing, infringed. However, you're talking about the method of making it, the trade, which is usually secret. That's correct. And and that's hard. That's 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 really incredibly valuable. And I'm not. So, are we talking about the government forcing trade secrets to be shared too? See, I don't think the TRIPS agreement covers the trade secrets, and it doesn't cover the capital investment needed to build the facilities needed to make these products. The, the thing the public doesn't always understand is just how capital, in, capital intense, intensive the manufacturing processes are. This is not like you make it up in a batch and it's you know, like, like a chemical and then you're done. These are biologics, and they require upstream and downstream processing where you make things in reactors and then you purify them and then you go through other purification steps and all along the way, a tremendous amount of quality control is used. And 
once you've built your facility and validated your facility, you've invested a tremendous amount up front before you can make anything. I just think in a crisis like this, the time lag associated with doing that ramp up is so steep and the cost is so steep, it would be more efficient to use the facilities we have and maybe expand capacity in them than to start from scratch and try and make that because I, I think most of the art is in that, in that processing capability. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> say, um, and maybe Ira, maybe this is a question, I'm not sure how it'll come out, um, because I did mention that one of the things that Access to Medicines advocates have been asking for is for um, people with the know-how to help teach people in other parts of the world um, how to do these things. Um, and we are just a little over a year um, since the TRIPS waiver was proposed. And so I feel like that's like lost time um, that you know we've kind of been sitting and talking about this thing um, and nothing's happened. Um, and so I think that the production capacity um, because the donations has been kind of the main thing but countries aren't able to deliver them and, um, and capacity at least by those who are producing them hasn't been expanded. Um, and so I think that more collaboration um, is something that's necessary. But I mean, I will say that, like I agree, it's definitely not only patents, but patents is definitely a piece of the puzzle here, um, especially like patents and secondary patents and things like that. Um, and so the WHO does have this, um, they're trying to set up hubs like mRNA, um, like development hubs in different regions in order to um, have, you know, kind of regional development and output. And, um, and so the thing is, is that if um, companies would pitch in, kind of share the, um, you know, the processes and the, the know-how and how to make those vaccines, then it might contribute to, you know, closing that capacity gap, um, but we, we've just not gotten anywhere with that. So Lee, though, um, that's a great uh -huh. point. Um, the, you know, a lot of organizations around the world are calling for these waivers, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. and they want to share IP and, you know, through facilities to set up by the World Health Organization, et cetera. So, I mean, well, the, how will this actually, what's the plan though? I mean, okay, we set things up, but how does this get equitable access? How does this help people who need the drugs to get them? How does this help equitable access? That's really my question. Yeah, I mean, I think that because part of the part of the problem right now is that, um, you know, the vaccines that are available are too expensive for people in poorer countries to have them. And then, um, and then there often just aren't enough. Um, and so with the patent waivers, it would kind of at least start um, a process of countries being able to, you know, if they do have the technology or facilities in their country to be able to make some vaccines, um, then they can start. Um, and I also want to say that this is also moving into treatments and therapeutics. Um, so, you know, as people continue to not be vaccinated, we'll you know, COVID continues to spread and variants and, you know, we just kind of went through this Delta wave. Um, and so people will be suffering from COVID for a long time. And so, um, so this problem is already starting to show in, especially like the monoclonal antibodies. Um, for example, Roche's, I, I can never say these drug names, so I won't even try, <laughs> but Roche's, um, <laughs> monoclonal antibody was is the only treatment actually approved now by WHO and um, and colleagues from Doctors Without Borders have said that they're just not able to get it because um, it's too, or in, for example, India's in specific, in particular, they were talking about, it's just too expensive. Um, and then there wasn't, it wasn't available. And then Roche, um, 
is very secretive about their capacity. Like they won't even, or at least I won't say what Roche is doing, but MSF says, or Doctors Without Borders says, you know, they can't get the information, like how much do you have? How much can you produce? And so it's this, some practices that have been just okay for a long time, which may be in normal times are fine, but now during a time of crisis and emergency, um, you know, people are dying um, because of these practices. So I don't think people are dying because of these practices. Let's let, let you know the people are dying because of COVID. Could could we? Well, yeah, yeah. Could we help prevent people from dying by more equitable and greater distribution and greater supply? No question about that. No argument. I think there are a number of things going on. Uh, the first is capacity. Uh, it's a miracle that Pfizer was able to create the capacity for their vaccine that they have. And they did it by repurposing existing facilities. And their supply chain uh, is very complex because it's not all being made in one big factory. They do certain things in certain facilities, certain things in other facilities. And uh, it turned out they had those capabilities for other products and they were able to repurpose and divert them. But those are not inexpensive facilities. Um, those facilities already existed. So it wasn't as though we had to break ground, build those facilities, and then make those drugs. That would have taken many years. So it's it's kind of a, a, a logistical and processing uh, feat that they pulled off to be able to create those facilities. Moderna did build theirs from scratch, but they were already working for, for a number of years in mRNA uh, beforehand. But the other thing is, uh, the cost to build this and the profits associated with it. Vaccines traditionally have not been a very profitable part of uh, a pharmaceutical or biotech business. In fact, uh, when I was at Wyeth and we made flu vaccines, um, this was a 7% margin business on average when most pharmaceuticals have um, much higher margins than those. So. Um, the deal that Pfizer cut with the U.S. government uh, is, is a, something like $19 a dose, if, as I recall. Um, for a Western country, that's a very low cost for a, a treatment or a you know, for a vaccine to prevent a, a disease. However, in certain countries like India and China, the average healthcare spend per patient per year for all diseases is less than the cost of a single dose of this vaccine. Um, I recall that when I worked in India, the average uh, cost per patient uh, for healthcare was something like, like $8 so, uh, for everything per year. So you're talking about taking something from one system and putting it in another system where the numbers don't match. So there has to be a way to drive the cost down significantly in order to enable this to work. Um, the other side of this is in regions of the world where patent law is generally not um, adhered to um, and uh, knockoffs of products occur. And I, I dealt with that in China where uh, one of the drugs we were making, a drug called Rapimune for transplantation was being uh, counterfeited. Um, the counterfeit actually was super potent. Uh, it was purer than ours. Uh, it didn't have some of the same impurities and the holograph on the label that was supposed to prevent counterfeit was perfect. It was absolutely perfect. And we got complaints from physicians that patients were getting a dose that was too high. And when we ran chemical analyses, we found actually that the counterfeiter was making a, a more potent and purer product than the original cell line that we were deriving ours from. So, you know, patent law is only part of this, manufacturing know-how being the other part, and the capacity and timing to build supply chain at a cost structure that fits the, uh, the budgets of various nations is another part. So I think there's a bigger problem here because let's assume uh, that uh, the TRIPS uh, waivers or, or, or provisions were all put in place and 
companies were forced to divulge how they make these products, not just the formulation, but the manufacturing know-how. I still think it would be several years before we could see any meaningful production in these regions because of the, the, you know, the time cost and complexity associated with the manufacturing. And that's why I'm back to my original thinking that a smarter approach is to, is to, is to force donation of some sort or to create uh, you know, equitable distribution uh, systems because I, I, I just know how hard and, and, and difficult it is to, to, to build up these, this capacity. These are not like chemistry that you, you, we all grew up with where you make something and it's a small batch. These are very large reactors where, um, where strains are grown and then purified and then separated and then purified. And then, I mean, there are just many, many steps to this. I actually teach about this. And it's the same with the monoclonal antibodies. They follow very similar processes and they're very complex. And I'm just concerned that logistically, the time to build and create this capacity is so immense and the cost is so immense that um, by the time we get there with this approach, many people will have died. Um, I do believe that this is a, and it now going to become an endemic disease that's gonna to have to be treated every year as a new, vari as new variants emerge. And, and the profit really isn't that great. Uh, believe it or not, uh, the, the reason Moderna is doing well is because the stock market, you know, th that's where they made their money. It's, they, you know, investors have invested in them. It's, they're a one product company. If you notice Pfizer's stock price did not go up much because this is a small product for a very big company. And it's, it's marginal contribution to their profitability is, is actually pretty small. It's almost a public service for them. So shouldn't, should they limit those profits though, even? Uh, I, mean, I mean, that's the, the calling is for. I mean, I, I, I tossed out to either of you, Lee or Ira. I mean, these, these, if there's not a big profit um, for these drugs, should they limit the profits further? Should the government put that up? Well, it used to be that's what the free market would do. Um, when uh, when I worked for a company that made vaccines and there were three or four vaccine makers, there wasn't much margin in it because the government bought most of the vaccines from us at a fixed price. Um, and I'm not opposed to doing that for a, a global emergency. I think there's some merit in that because if you're guaranteed a certain amount, of sales, you can you can amortize that across your other products if you're a diverse company like a Pfizer. If you're a Moderna, however, or if you're a small company like mine, which by the way does have a COVID therapeutic that we are trying to get in the clinic, if you limit our price, we're out of business. So I, I think there's a, it's a difficult question. And I think it's not one that can be solved at my pay grade. It's it's more for the politicians, I think, to to figure out how to how to address in an equitable fashion. But I think it's a it's it's a slippery slope, especially when you talk about therapeutics, because there are big margins on therapeutics. And if you start to give them away and I, I deal with countries like China and India, where um, it's not even worth patenting your product in some of those countries because of the lack of adherence to to IP law, um, then you really have to question why you're in business to begin with. Well, I, I, I um, actually, uh, China's working quite hard on their improving, at least that's what the PR is, but um, there are other, there are, are um, benefits. Actually, China's probably the second largest jurisdiction after the US. In fact, they have more patent filings than any other country in the world. And uh, I'm not trying to push you back on that, but uh, I will say, um, although there's, um, they do, uh, most clients of mine are, they have to, they feel compelled to protect in China. And uh, I, I'm going off on a different, tan on a tangent here. I'm sorry. But uh, the, uh, I, I agree though, there's still a lot, a long ways to go to make it um, give the value of a real patent like it would have in Europe or the US. I, I well, agree we, we, we have filed patents in China as well, but I, I will not manufacture in China because as soon as we manufacture in China, we'll get paid 
one royalty payment and after that we know they'll manufacture it themselves yeah, yeah. Uh, so we will we will not provide the formulation ip or manufacturing trade secrets in, in china because we don't expect there to we there those to be respected in terms of prevention and and india is far worse so we're dealing with two parts of the world where there's very poor protection and yet a big complaint that they're not getting that they're not getting equity in terms of access. Well, so you got so, so that's a good point. I mean, you got some countries that are great with patent protection, others that are, are not so great. Um, so Lee, like, what what impact have do these pet, limited monopolies of patents give you have on access to these COVID nineteen vaccines? Then I mean, or you know, in this in in this background. Um. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that we've covered that a bit um, in that the patent holder, I guess actually you maybe said it in your introduction, the patent holder um, really does control, um, you know, who, you know, how much, where they go. Um, yeah, production, distribution, you know, the capacity pricing. Mm -hmm. um, but also, I mean, I do think, and I think one thing that we haven't said is when it comes to um, the costs and recovering costs, um, both the, at least Moderna and the BioNTech um, vaccines were heavily funded by um, taxpayer dollars. And so, um, so that is also, I think something to take into consideration, um, especially as um, I was part of the free the vaccine campaign. Um, oh, yeah, you I know, what, if, as a taxpayer of the United States, I want my yeah. profit. I want well, my money back. Thing, I want to charge everybody else money. Oh, <laughs> like, well, why should I, why should we pay twice? And also yeah. like, why can't, why don't I have a say in what happens with <laughs> my tax dollars? Well, um, yeah, I mean, I guess we don't often have a say. I know, and, so, yeah. um, and, and then there's also the thing, I mean, I, maybe it's because I'm poor, um, but I don't think the money being made from these vaccines is insignificant. Um, I mean, people have become billionaires and, um, and that's a lot of money being made. Um, and so, I mean, I, so I think that there is, I don't know, it's, it just seems exorbitant to me. Um, and I say that as a person with basically no money. So, um, so I think that there is kind of this balance that we have to think about, um, you know, how much does this profit motive, um, you know, outweigh the motive of, you know, trying to make sure that everybody can have access to this. Um, and I do take Iris point that, you know, like donations um, might be better. I mean, if, if we could get donations out there, um, you know, if they, you know, if there was enough vaccines um, and medicines being made to deliver to the world, but countries, neither countries nor companies are actually um, following through on what they've pledged to donate. Um, and then there's also the, you know, the idea of, um, I mean, there are, um, I mean, there is capacity in capacity as far as um, the skills and the knowledge to be able to do these things and to, you know, to learn um, and to make these products in other countries. And, um, and at least with what the WHO has set up um, and also the, um, I think some of the, um, like the accelerator um, mechanisms that have been set up with um, public-private partnerships and things, there is money um, to kind of go into ramping up things. So um, so I don't think it's this total loss, like it's it'll take too long. I mean, we've already just kind of wasted a year talking about this waiver thing. Um, so if I think that if more people start to, you know, come to the table and we're not just like begging and kind of relying on charity from um, companies that, you know, we could really start to close this this access gap so yeah go oh sorry go ahead i want to respond to something that has become very popular that i think i heard resonating which is that the nih and the government uh 
pays for all research and, and, and that's where all new, new science inventions come from. Um, I worked for uh, someone who spent many years at the NIH and then he was my mentor for a number of years um, who had a chart that showed uh, NIH research spending versus industry research spending um, in the development of new uh, drugs and treatments. And it might surprise you that the crossover between industry spending and government spending occurred in 1986. Um, it may be that the NIH funds a lot of things and they primarily fund targets, finding new science and new targets. What they don't primarily fund is the development aspect associated with the drugs that then go after those targets. And that is- What do you mean by a target, Ira? To get kids, to so, a target. so discovering, discovering that, that binding to a specific site in a cell uh, can provide a treatment for a specific disease, that's a target. Finding the five or six molecules that bind to that target and then figuring out how to make those, study those, test those, determine the safe dosage, manufacture those, that's almost always done by industry. And so it may be that the NIH primes the pump in science in terms of identifying where to look, but, and that public money is used for that. And I think that's a good use of public money in terms of furthering science. Most of the money that is spent uh, to get that from a target to a, a treatment is spent by industry. Um, far more money is spent by industry than by public tax dollars. So it may be that at the core of identifying the target for doing that, but mRNA can work, for example, which was done originally, by the way, at the University of Pennsylvania, about 15 miles from where I'm sitting um, in, in the Philly area, uh, 20 years ago um, by, by two professors. It may be that that funding enabled us to see the potential to do this, the billions of dollars that then got spent in clinical trials and proving that it works far exceeded that original NIH funding. So this concept that, well, the government invents ever, pays to invent everything and then these greedy companies come along and profit from it is, is really not quite accurate because most of the risk is taken uh, in, in, in investing in things, most of which fail, by the way, uh, to get the few that the public sees as a, as a success. Uh, and that's done using private money uh, by companies that go out in the marketplace, some of whom succeed and many of whom fail. Um, the other thing that I did want to mention is we're, we're focusing on Pfizer and, and Moderna here. Um, there are other vaccine technologies um, that are more traditional than the mRNA technology that have shown efficacy in this pandemic. You know, the J and J approach is a traditional vaccine approach. The um, the uh, AstraZeneca Oxford approach is a traditional vaccine approach. Those technologies are much better understood, uh, much more scalable in terms of process technology, and much cheaper to to, to manufacture and scale. Uh, and they don't have the cold chain uh, uh, supply issues. They don't have the major distribution issues. So, you know, the, the WHO, who obviously know more about this than anyone, in sort of identifying ways to mitigate the pandemic globally, could be focused on uh, more readily off the shelf approaches to, um, to creating vaccines regionally that are less expensive uh, to make and more easily uh, distributed. Um, and I believe there are probably more patent uh, approaches associated with those that, that may indeed uh, enable you to do this without, uh, without TRIPS waivers in order to, because killed, attenuated, uh, killed or attenuated vaccine approaches have been used for over, over a century. So I'm just suggesting that there may be more fruitful things to focus on in terms of getting an outcome 
than just Moderna and and uh, and uh, Pfizer. Right. Well, we have uh, thanks, guys. I we have fifteen minutes. Um, I'd like to. I know we talk about ten to fifteen minutes for questions from the audience, and um, so maybe I can. Uh, uh, we can take some some of these questions. I have seen some questions. I'm I'm a little confused on process. I'm getting questions in a question and answers panel. Is um, uh, Lydia? Is that um, is that where I I'm getting the questions from? Or Valeria? Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. So I'm going to read a couple some question questions some questions from the audience, and either one of you guys can take it unless it's directed towards you. Um, let me read this one. It's been shown that almost 50% of all new molecules that are classified as, quote, novel and innovative um, by the FDA and qualify for accelerated approval process are discovered at publicly funded institutions. After this, patents are often licensed to pharma companies. Do you think that publicly funded institutions need different mechanisms of transferring those technologies to remain in control of those patents and ultimately prevent private 20 year monopolies? I'm going to qualify it or because, uh, you know, as we all know, once the day it goes off, I'm a patent guy. I got to tell you, it's not a monopoly forever and monopolies are illegal uh, that drive up prices. So should they should they do something? Anyone have any either you two have any thoughts on that? So I'm running a company that licensed this technology from a public university. Um, so the the university gave us an exclusive right to develop that technology in exchange, the university gets royalties uh, and uh, annual license fees. Um, and, you know, you might think that's, you know, that, that that should then be made public, but let me tell you, we're the ones taking a risk to develop it. Um, we're the ones that are out raising money. We're the ones that are working with no sal, actually for me, no salary. Um, so we're taking significant risk to, to uh, develop those technologies. And I think if you decided that tomorrow, well, we should just give that away. First of all, there's a lot of money that need, that's needed to go from that original idea or molecule to a drug. Um, and that takes a long time, it involves testing it in, in animals and humans, figuring out how to scale it up, et cetera. Uh, but secondly, there'd be no innovation if you did that. I mean, we would be done. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty blunt about it. And I've licensed technologies when I worked in big pharma that were invented at universities. The lion's share of the development cost is after that license is signed, uh, not the initial invention. And, and um, if, if you, I mean, I think something like less than 5% of the cost is in develop is in the invention and probably 95% of the cost is in the development. I mean, I, I would think to that um, as a person who likes to invest in um, companies, not necessarily pharma companies, that's outside of my ball, my league, but um, I'd hate to think that a company is going to spend millions or billions of dollars developing something. And then some, after they finish it, they'll just, knock it off, it, some other company will come along and do it better. Uh, happens in other in areas. I mean, um, you start a fruit store and you do it right. Uh, someone can start a fruit store next to you and beat you up. And so that's the kind of the other side of the coin. But um, I think, you know, with pharma, it's, I guess it's not a fruit store. So. Um, can I also? Yeah, sure, please, Lee, sorry. Um, I think that um, it, that's a really good question, um, Kareem. Sorry, I've got like one good eye. Um, and what folks that I work with um, have said is that, especially when the, um, the technologies are developed at publicly funded institutions, um, that kind of, I mean, there are some different kind of like alternative models that um, folks are thinking about in order to try to make sure that these new technologies or medicines are accessible to um, a wider range of people. And one of the things that's proposed, not formally proposed, but discussed is, um, you know, for example, the NIH um, kind of writing their contracts. And I say, this is the NIH, I'm, um, it might be different for, but it could be the same for the, um, the European agencies and the um, governments over here that fund research, 
but um, but you know, to so put a clause in the contract that um, that you know maybe they hold a patent or part of the patent or shared rights or something like that. Um, and then there's also like thinking of the risk aspect. I wanted to um, say for at least with the COVID vaccines um, and contracts, at least in the EU, um, I'm not sure about the US contracts, but um, there was a waiver of risk or of liability. And so the companies haven't really had to um, take on any extra risk or liability, whether it's, I mean, including with like not being able to deliver. So, um, so I think that some of the provisions like that in contracts that um, often favor the companies might be changed in order to, um, you know, to make sure that everybody delivers and that um, everybody can have access. Those are like very small things. Of course, they're not just like solutions to the problem, but those are some things that um, have been criticized and suggested. It's it's worth discussing waiver of liability, which is um, the standard in the US and I don't know the EMEA rules, but mm -hmm. in, the, in the US vaccine manufacturers um, have protection from liability through a national uh, vaccine of, of essentially a uh, indemnification fund. That fund occurred after a side effect in vaccines occurred about 30 years ago, the side effect being Guillain-Barre syndrome, which some patients contracted uh, due to an earlier vaccine. Um, and the problem was that vaccine manufacturers were unable to obtain insurance uh, to make and sell their products. And after that, the government set up a, a, a fund that in essence provides insurance for patients who are injured due to vaccines, um, which can occur. Uh, let's be very clear, any body who ingests anything in their body and it, it, you know, has, has a risk. Um, if you drink two gallons of water in a very short period of time, you will drown. I mean, you, you can get sick uh, and water's pretty safe, but anything brings with it risk. Um, vaccines are not perfect. Uh, they are not 100%. There seems to be a perception in the public that, you know, vaccines are 100%. Vaccines work by getting a herd immunity created where a majority of the public um, has been vaccinated or has had a disease. And consequently, there's no more hosts for the virus to grow in. Um, but that vaccines do have side effects and they vary from person to person. We are Despite our DNA being something like 99.9% .9 identical, you can just look on the call and we're all different. Um, so we all have our own unique idiosyncratic reaction to drugs and vaccines. Um, and so in the US, there is indemnification to the manufacturers through this government insurance fund without which I don't think any corporation would take the risk of making a vaccine. I don't know that that exists elsewhere in the world. It does raise an issue as to what would happen if the uh, IP was provided and the know-how was provided and vaccines were being made in other places and uh, patients were injured by those vaccines. Um, that to me also argues for keeping the control central and distributing uh, globally uh, because I have been involved in a situation where a generic manufacturer made a drug that a company I worked for made, and they sued the, the originator of the technology and not the generic manufacturer when the drug was misused by, in a clinic. And by the way, they won. So, oh. um, so there is a significant risk that manufacturers uh, see associated with their business. And that's why these funds occur, uh, exist in the US. I don't know what the counterpart is in the rest of the world, but I suspect there's something similar. Yeah, it sounds like something that needs to be, um, we need to have though to keep the uh, oils, keep the uh, grease, the gears oiled. Um, we got another question here that, might, that really piqued my interest. Um, 
Uh, it's from Marcus. It says, is there any information on when the break-even point was reached by some of the pharmaceutical companies? And if the main concern about waivers is investors and corporations, quote, getting their money's worth, quote, wouldn't it be acceptable to force companies to reveal this information and agree on a waiver after a certain threshold has been reached? Um, you know, I, I my first thought when I read that is, geez, you know, if you have an accountant, you can, you know, profits and break-even point can change, you know, really be, uh, I'm not sure how confident I would be in the break-even point. And then another thing that Ira mentioned, and I think I mentioned opening up, I mean, you might have a break-even point on one drug, but you failed on 10 other drugs. So how do you calculate that break-even point? But that's me not being the industry expert on it. I'd love to hear Lee or Ira's thoughts on that question. I mean, I'm not an industry expert either, um, but I mean, I would say, and, and so I understand, you know, it's like a kind of a melange of where all the um, you know revenue and things are, are coming from, but um, but I mean, this this conversation is it reflects the the difficulty that um, lots of folks are having around this issue because we because like I think I said earlier, there's kind of this balance between you know human rights, the right to health and life and things, and then you know corporate rights. Um, to patents and things and um, and then making a lot of money. I mean, there is a lot of money being made here. And so, um, and so of course I'll say, yeah, I mean, maybe there should be a break even point. And then because we're in a public health emergency, um, then please just, you know, force companies or open patents or do what we have to do to make sure that the world has access to this these medicines and also the um, the at least the trips waiver and some of the other um, um, things that are being asked for and sharing of the know how and tech and things are, are only during for during the public health emergency. It's no one's asking for this to be forever. And as Ira said earlier, you know, COVID is going to become endemic. And so if we can just kind of get over what feels like this hump. I think I'm being very optimistic talking about it that way. Um, you know, during this time of emergency, so you can get out of lockdowns because I mean, there's a lot of other things happening. I mean, mental health concerns, people not being able to go back to work. I mean, where places are having to go into lockdown. So there are lots of other um, issues going on. And, um, and I think that, you know, when we think narrowly about, you know, the medicines, which is very important, um, you know, we can get tied up into this very technical conversation that doesn't quite take into account the full um, view of what's happening to people in the world. So I've spent my career in public health, and mm -hmm. um, I'm completely empathetic with the need to, to make uh, the distribution of medicines and vaccines more equitable. Um, I worked on a project for river blindness in Ghana where we donated the drug to the WHO after we showed that it worked. Um, I'm, I'm very empathetic to the issue. On the other hand, every quarter I present to my investors and I can't imagine going to them and saying, well, we're gonna hit break even and then we're gonna give it away. I don't think I would have investors very long if I kept doing that. And the lifeblood of a small company is the investors, you know, to us, that capital is, is, is what keeps the company alive. So there's a, there's a very hard trade-off here. And um, I think that the heads of the big pharmas and the big biotechs who have the resources to do this in a more equitable manner are the ones that ought to be engaged in these discussions on a global level. Um, and maybe there's a quid pro quo for them to provide vaccines in, in exchange for access for selling other products in those markets. So uh, especially in the time of a national, uh, international rather emergency. Um, but I do worry that the precedence that these uh, changes are setting could then spill down to the smaller players like the one that I'm currently running and, and have a major impact on us. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I don't pretend to have the answer here because, you know, my heart says we need to solve the problem and my head says we, ha we have to also protect 
our our investors. So that's that's to me the crux of the dilemma, and I think it's a political social issue more than a a patent and uh, technology issue. But I mean, if people are going to make less money on COVID um, fixing COVID, and, and they're going to make it instead on measles or make up the make up the illness, um, would pe when people move want to move away from COVID? I mean, I, I wonder if that's the other thing. I mean, given the human nature, but I got to leave it at that because we did hit our hour, um, and uh, I'm going to pass it back over to our hosts. So thanks again, Stephen, our wonderful moderator, and to Iris Specter and Lee Haynes, our thought-provoking speakers. Um, it is not often that speakers with your backgrounds have the opportunity to sit down and have such a respectful discussion that appreciates both points of view regarding IP rights during global health crises. Um, we all thank you today for your insights. And on behalf of the German American Conference, I also thank all of today's participants for your engagement. Um, I will now hand it over to our conference co-chair, Isabel Kleitsch.